I think I was introduced to the world of um, outdoor classrooms or uh, school gardens about 20 years ago. And uh, I think by the time I finished my tour, I could literally feel my heart singing, sort of like when you first fall in love. And, um, and I must say, I had exactly the same experience yesterday visiting the gardens uh, here. And um, that's the first half of what I want to talk about, which is the six awesome things about school gardens. But I also want to tell you about two awful things, which is we are going to face some resistance. Despite the fact it makes our hearts sing, there's some adults that that doesn't work for. And we have to find another language that will make their heart sing. And um, so I've, I've spent a big chunk of my career trying to find that language. And, um, and I hope I'm going to be able to introduce it to you today. I, I have uh, seven words that I hope uh, to uh, teach you about and a, a couple of uh, concepts that will help you understand the adults who are having some trouble uh, learning this and help you explain what we see as the alchemy, you know, the old science of turning lead to gold. We're turning troubled communities into beautiful communities with a future. And uh, how to translate in, in that into terms they'll understand. Um, and so I want to introduce you first to seven words I hope you're going to uh, learn today. Um, and the first is solutionary. And that's the beginning for us, which is we come to the world with solutions and proposals, not with problems and complaints. OK, and there's several reasons for doing that. Usually when you meet somebody in the government who's serious, they will say, what problem do you solve? And so it's not only that we want to be positive and come to the world with solutions, it gives us our answer to the first serious question that somebody asks us, which is, what, what is the problem you're going to solve? There's two parts to it. What's the problem and what's your solution? And um, I think um, the th third part is you're making a commitment as a solutionary that not only am I going to suggest this is what you're going to do, I'm going to help you do it. I'm not just going to lay the problem on your lap and take off. That's a, also part and parcel of a solutionary. And fourth is that you radiate positive energy, which I got to say, I, was, I thought maybe marijuana was legal here because the buzz was so <laughs> incredible. Um, but then maybe you don't care what the law says anyway. But, um, um, and the point is, is that I don't know if you remember old uh, Superman movies or whatever, but you know what kryptonite is? Positive energy is like kryptonite to complainers. And so when we want to have a movement of positive people, all you have to do is be positive and they'll <laughs> So that's an important thing. And finally is we want to change the discourse the way the public talks about issues. OK, we are not about doom and gloom. We are about hope and joy. And we are not about nuts and berries. We're about nuts and bolts. Okay? And so and we're part of a discourse of hope for the future, not anger. Uh, and so I think that's the things that are involved in being a solutionary. Multifunctional is a bit like a Swiss army knife. Like, what's the purpose of a Swiss army knife? You can see about 10 things that it does there. And uh, we're often used to things that have what I call a dedicated purpose. It just does one thing. But if you want to understand something like gardens and especially school gardens, you don't want to answer the question, what does it do? What's the problem? It's not what's the problem it solves. It's what are the problems that it solves? And so our society is not well equipped to understand multifunctionality. And uh, the essence of gardens is that they're multifunctional. And so when we work on that, we try to get a couple of things um, going. One is, when you're multifunctional, you don't, have to, you don't have the same problem of polarization, which many people talk about. It's very common across North America and even Europe in these days. Because 
you know, if I say to you, you know what, kids love gardens, and they say to me, I don't like kids, uh, <laughs> then I gotta say, it teaches kids the value of work so they don't think money grows on trees. Okay. So uh, when you have a multifunctional thing like uh, gardens, you can judge the person you're gonna be trying to persuade and use the many functions that it does to help them understand. So that's the real key to it for advocates. <clears throat> it allows you, if also if you're in the advocacy and business talk, there's a term called market segmentation. I'm gonna introduce you to 15 purposes of a outdoor garden. You're gonna come up with five more and then I'm gonna tell you five that you missed. So we're gonna do 25 functions of a outdoor garden today. And uh, when you can do that, you understand something about the special economy of a garden. If you ask how much food came out of that garden it, after how much labor, you would say, that's not a very efficient way to produce food. And it's actually true. It's not the most efficient way to produce food. But given that we're producing 25 things, we don't have to be. We're also very efficient at turning kids who might otherwise end up in gangs into productive citizens. And we're also turning kids who might never have graduated from high school into university graduates. We're pretty efficient at that. So we want to make sure that they don't apply an efficiency standard that is totally inappropriate because we're multifunctional. And um, so that's my second term. My third is a term called nutritionism. And um, nutrition is a pretty new uh, science and it's a pretty new profession as well. It really came into its own only during World War II, long after physics and chemistry anthropology and uh, sociology. And part of the reason why it came <clears throat> to, uh, to the fore in World War II is that North America and European powers were trying to A, make sure that their soldiers were strong and able to uh, uh, engage in combat. And also so the civilian population would be strong. This is a time when women were coming into factories and so they would have a high morale. And so, the, <clears throat> you know, you probably heard of the food guide. These all came out across the world in the, the, during the Second World War. And, and here you see two posters that were used by the American uh, government to promote eating for uh, health and, and the importance of nutrition. And so the, that had many positive sides, but it did have a negative side, which was when people think about nutrition, they think about stronger bodies uh, and um, they think in it very narrowly in terms of its impact on your physical health. And that makes it difficult for people who are used to that, and this is ingrained very deeply in the conscious and unconscious of North America. They don't think of food as something that teaches people to work together. They don't think of it as being about mental health. They don't think about it as teaching people how to get along at work. They don't see any of the potentials of food that we think of other than the nutritional one. And so that has been a problem in the discussion about food in North America and Europe is that deep in the unconscious is this narrow understanding of nutrition, not the broad understanding which it deserves. The fourth concept is informal learning. So the rough rule on that is, I think most people know uh, an iceberg is uh, nine tenths below the surface. Your unconscious in your mind is 95% below the surface. So your mind that's hearing this talk, uh, participating in a, any kind of formal learning activity is only engaging 5% of your brain. And the other 95% of the brain, most of it is clued into informal learning. And I believe in the educational field, we focus way too much on the 5% and not anywhere near enough on the 95%. And community gardening does both, or school gardening does both. And <clears throat> so that's a really important concept to understand when we're 
talking to people in the educational field. Fifth is the con concept or term called generative, generative thinking. Uh, Gene yesterday, one of the farmers, said, I look after 20 farms, and each one of them is different, and the person I work with works on 20 farms, and each one of them is different. That is a generative idea. We have an idea that people can learn from being in a garden. Okay, and then there is nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come. And that is a powerful idea. But it doesn't multiply and spread because we make a, a company out of it and, and uh, a franchise and we do each one the same. Each one generates its own significance. And so it's a special time of spreading. Um, and if I hadn't taken so long to get to here, I would have shown you this really cool thing, which is you, if you wanted to hide it with three dots going across on a piece of paper and try to figure out how you would get four lines, never raising your pencil, four straight lines to cover all of those dots, you'll get that is one tough thing for you to figure out because your mind automatically is trained that you can't go outside the box. Okay, so the key to generative thinking is thinking outside of the box. And that's people who can't think outside of the box, who don't know you go down further, then back, and then up, and then out again, are the people who say, we don't need school gardens. <laughs> okay, they do not think in a generative way. So you just want to try that trick on them and then say, now, let's talk about gardening. Now, <clears throat> you might say, well, that's a pretty beautiful picture of the Rockies. Um, but there's not much really happening there. There's no people, there's no stores, there's no gambling, none of the things we associate with civilization. And, um, and we are very uh, nearsighted. As a civilization, we cannot see all the things that are happening there. The things that are happening that we're not seeing are called ecosystem services. And they are working 24-7 long before the computer got us working 24-7. So first, you can see that all the flowers, they're pollination happening. And without pollination, one-fifth of the fruits and vegetables in the world would not exist. Um, we can see trees are sucking up water uh, from a rainfall and then letting it go when it evaporates during the day so that not all the rain that falls in the Rocky Mountains on the one side stays there but also gets a chance to come into the Midwest. Otherwise, the Midwest would be totally dry without any natural rainfall. Um, those are just two of the things. They're filtering water through the ground and cleansing it. Probably, if I, I wanted to take up your time, I could tell you 20 things that are happening in that picture where nothing seems to be happening. And those are called ecosystem services. And nature does it all for us for how much money? Nothing. They are delivered free to us 24-7, and we don't give it any value. If you look at what's the gross national product in America, there will be nothing for forest. If you chop it down, it will make the gross domestic product. But if you leave it standing, it is worth nothing. That's how our economy misunderstands ecosystem services. And to know what a garden is doing in a school, it is only working part of the time teaching. It's working 24-7, all summer long and all winter long, on ecosystem services. And that's what I, one of the things that very few uh, officials understand. Disruptive innovation. When we think of the people who block innovation, we usually think of it as uh, blue collar workers who don't want to have automation come and take their job. But the very famous concept of disruptive innovation, which comes from a Harvard professor named Christensen, is no, actually the major barriers to innovation are not the blue collar workers at the bottom who are gonna lose their jobs. It's the people near the top who are making really good money and don't want it and not doing very much and they, they wanna keep things just the way they are. That and a disruptive innovation is an innovation that disrupts them. 
So Rick, who's going to be talking to you later on today, his son fixes, or used to fix, dirt bikes. Now, you might ask yourself, how come Harley Davidson never invented the dirt bike? Just like you might ask, how come IBM never invented the desktop? The Harley Davidson, you know, if, imagine if you're a salesperson or in the marketing team with Harley Davidson, you see a 55-year-old accountant who never had a teenage life, and they come in and say, I want a hog. <laughs> okay, and they're gonna leave giving you 30,000 bucks. They're gonna have leather and studs all over the place and everything else. And then compare it to, how'd you like to meet some high school kid with tattered jeans and everything else, wants to get a dirt bike for $2,000? Which of, does the marketing team want to deal with? They never thought there was such a thing as dirt bikes. Honda sent over some people from Japan who had, where dirt bikes are really popular, and whenever they went dirt biking uh, with their bikes they brought from Japan in Los Angeles, Everyone flocked around to see them, and they wrote back and said, people seem to be going nuts over dirt bikes. And so that's how Honda invented, okay, it was a disruptive innovation in the industry. And it is the most powerful force, in my opinion, resisting the force of outdoor classrooms. So let me go through some of these ideas um, one at a time. M multifunctional, this is my first garden where my heart sang. Okay, you can see in the background, those are uh, high rises. Uh, this is uh, in the, pretty close to the center of downtown Toronto, a very low income uh, multicultural uh, community. Um, so the first thing you see that, you, that appears to be just a bunch of kids having a good time, just like ecosystem services, there's a lot going on below the surface, more than a pretty face. And these kids, are appreciating the outdoors, which they don't ever see in their life. Their whole life, pretty well, is concrete and high rises. And they are now experiencing dirt and flowers and grass and all the smells of nature for the first time in their lives, their short lives. They're learning that males and females are equal. You know, when I grew up, I think I was asking some other people who are closer to my age, they never had it quite as severe as me, but for me, when you were a kid, like in six years old and seven years old, one of the great thrills of your life would be to get a frog or a worm and put it down a girl's shirt. <laughs> you know, and then they go, and um, then the teacher would ball you out, and, but you'd be laughing about it for the rest. So we had a really strong understanding of what's the difference between a boy and a girl. And now, as you see from them, the girls are right, they're right in there. And so what's somebody picking up? Just like nature is doing it unseen, they're thinking boys and girls have the same. They have the same rights, the same abilities. It's a really powerful, le important lesson that's going on. They're learning uh, the joy of working with uh, soil, and uh, they're learning how to cooperate. They're learning teamwork. They're learning that if you don't hold up your end, you're letting other people down. Uh, so you could consider it a form of employment readiness education, they're learning how to count, they're learning colors, they're being calm, because the colors of green and blue are calming colors. And uh, they're learning a, a, that they may not be so good in one thing, but they're pretty good at this. They're gaining esteem. So there's a hundred things happening in this picture, no one of which should be the measure of whether it's a success. And that's the point we need to get. They're learning to enjoy simple pleasures, which we have often forgotten about. I think we have to confess. They're learning that work can be as much fun as recess, which can, is also, you know, I think Rick, who's also going to be working here, he always says, I don't, I don't work anymore. I just play. I just love my job so much, I can't even call it work. Right? So they're learning that simple principle. They're learning social skills and emotional intelligence which we got to say, there's a lot of people who, in positions of power have a low emotional quotient, right? Uh, they're learning team spirit. They're getting an activity break. Like for boys, I think it's fair to say, being in school at a young age is like prison, right? They just got, they're being accused of having 
you know, attention deficit disorder, they have nature deficit disorder. <laughs> and um, they're getting comfortable with boys and girls being equal. Uh, they're learning where food comes from. Okay, so there are so many people who think, where does food come from? It comes from the store, right? And, and that is they've taken the first big step to food literacy. They're learning practical skills. They're learning to respect work, which is not that widespread in our society. They're learning about the web of life, not the web of, on the internet. They're enjoying three forms of learning we need to introduce into the schools very, so they understand it deeply. Formal, that's when the teacher is talking to you. Non-formal, like a, maybe a workshop or a seminar. And informal. Experiential, that is you're learning it from doing and learning from your co-students and co-workers. All of them are equally valid ways of getting information. Um, they're learning that schools can be a neighborhood hub. They're not just a place you go to when you're a student. Your parents may come there. I was impressed by all the gardens we saw yesterday where parents are invited to have dinner with, with their kids right in the school. How, how is that for making you feel comfortable, like you belong, right? They're learning to be prosumers, okay? We are called consumers. Consuming used to be a disease that people died of, especially artists and poets. They all died of consumption in the 1700s and 1800s. And now it's the word we use to talk about consuming food. And no wonder we got a problem with consuming too much. And so we want to teach kids, no, you're not just a, on the consuming end of life, you're also on the producing. And that combination is called a prosumer. They're learning to compost. We throw out in the United States $161 billion worth of food a year. So learning to compost is giving value to $161 billion a year that would otherwise cause a problem. Hands-on skills. If you think of the words that in our language that describe hands, it's pretty interesting, like a green thumb, hands-on, roll up your sleeves. Um, you know, the term manufacture is from the Latin for make and by hand. Fact, Torah is to make and manu is land, um, hand. Uh, and even the phrase, the ultimate phrase of empowerment, to take power into your own hands. There's something in old language that understood that the hand was a powerful thing. And you know, there's more connections between the hand and the brain than the brain in any other part of the body. And when you, so kids need to work with their hands, adults need to work with their hands. And when you teach people how to use the hand, you are honoring the evolution of the human. Because when humans began to develop was when we could stand on two feet, leaving two limbs free as hands to handle tools. And without tools, humans would be goners. Because we don't run too fast, our eyes are not so good, our sense of smell ain't that good. Without tools, we'd be in trouble. And you think it's a big deal to have small tools today, like micro phones and micro uh, computers and everything, but the first tools developed by humans were small because we got hands with very delicate fingers that are well connected to our brain. And the brain would not have developed without the hand because they had to figure out, well, how the hell am I going to use that? The ones who survived were the ones who could figure it out. So um, you can see the evolution of humans as we move from you know, and they call people their knuckle dusters, uh, <laughs> you know, to standing erect. It's a big part of evolution, and the hand is key to it. And we cannot have enough respect for the hand. We've got to balance off respect for the brain and the hand and not insult people who go into manual training as you're a loser or something like that. So to my mind, it teaches us the power uh, and teaches us to respect and enjoy uh, the hand. Here's the awesome thing, third awesome thing about um, food. If, if, how many people know the word resilience? Okay, it's considered to be the most important word of the 21st century. Uh, because most of you probably may understand the quick and dirty definition of resilience is 
I knock you out, you go fall flat in your rear end, and then you stand up and I knock you out again. <laughs> so resilience is the ability to get up from the mat. That is the quick and dirty and actually inaccurate definition of resilience. And you need to know the definition of resilience because every society around the world is going to need it because it's not going to be me knocking you down on the mat. It's going to be a storm, a hurricane, a tornado, a heat wave, a drought. All of these things that planners said, we will build this city on the basis that it could happen in one year in 100 are going to happen one year in 20. That's the general average. And so every society is going to get knocked to the mat. And as a society, not as an individual, as a community, has to get off the mat. And I think that kids learn key skills for getting off the mat as a community in gardening. Uh, if you Google image, uh, Resilience, you'll get this one map it is of um, qualities of resilience. And the next one is the skills. And if I had time, I'd walk you through it slowly. But just sort of think, each one of those connects directly to gardening. Each one of them. Service, are you not? The teachers are learning service. The students are learning to help somebody else who's having some trouble, right? Self-efficacy and mastery, you're learning, you didn't know how to operate a tool, now you do. So it is a machine for teaching um, resilience. What societies do well and which ones don't, the difference is infrastructure. Not physical infrastructure, but social infrastructure. Societies that have what she calls collaborative infrastructure thrive with difficulty and those who don't die. What is happening here at a garden party? People are learning, they're building social infrastructure. Just like the picture of nature, you don't think anything is happening there, just some pretty things. See, people are learning to talk in intimate groups and learning emotional connection and all the skills of conversation, what male educators would call small talk. Um, so that you can come together as a community later. And they're learning all sorts of things about how to connect, how to steer an event, how to manage an event. And so they're learning the basics of collaborative infrastructure. And that's what you learn at a, at a garden. Uh, so it is a key teacher of and modeler of resilient skills. Climate protection. Um, you know that when you throw out that $161 billion of food and it goes into landfill, uh, it has, there's no oxygen down there in the landfill. And so it gives off methane as it rots. And methane is 22 times more powerful than carbon dioxide as a global warming thing. So the major source of global warming emissions in most cities is their landfill site. If you compost it, you reduce it 22 times just like that. So on top of that, you create soil, part of the life cycle of the food economy. So um, you cannot get much better benefits than that <laughs> uh, in a world where the climate is considered to be a problem. So you know the definition of garbage is um, like a weed is a plant that has a bad public relations department. And, um, <laughs> and garbage uh, is, uh, happens when you put a, a whole bunch of things in the wrong place. You put the right resources in the wrong place. So there's nothing wrong with food waste. It's just wrong if you put it in landfill. If you use it for compost, you actually get two things. You can actually create biogas, which has approximately the same as natural gas. You can actually pipe out the stuff from a landfill site and heat areas for blocks around it, just with the natural gas from there. So it's producing that plus soil. So it's just a resource in the wrong place when it's garbage. And we can teach kids to put it in the right place. Learn by doing, you know, perhaps the famous um, uh, saying from uh, Confucius, I think it should be uh, in every teacher's book. You hear, 
you know, you see, you remember, you do, you understand. And the key to education, in, um, there's a great um, a German theorist called Habermas, and I hope they're teaching it now in educational schools, is the key is understanding. You understand only by doing. And by interacting with others, you do not learn it formally. And so we are, as a society, need more understanding. And not just, you, you can also need to understand science. It's not just learning by rote. And so learning by doing, this is how you teach fermentation, how you teach that you progress through chemistry, everything. Um, and mental health. You know, most people, I think, could I get a sense of how many people have someone who's very close to them who has got a, a problem, a serious problem, with a chronic physical disease? Cancer, heart disease, diabetes. And how many people have someone who's very close to them who have a problem with a mental health issue? You see, it's actually more stuck their hand up for mental health than for physical, but it has no profile in our culture and society, right? It has only a stigma. This is what is called quality time. Okay, you do not have quality time to say, okay, kids, I got three minutes. Let's have some quality time. The kids pick the quality time, and you gotta be doing something else. You're not going, okay, kids, it's quality time. No, while you're having some private time, that's when they start to open up, right? It's when they switch the channel, as the principal put it. And so garden is where you get quality time, especially when parents are involved with, or but with anyone. And biophilia is known as humans need the nature connection. We were born in nature, and we need to be in nature. When you go into the woods or up a mountain hike, you get a special feeling. The air feels better. You feel more alive. You are calmed. You feel more in harmony. And that is called biophilia. We have a love of nature, which has a very hard time finding expression in a paved society. And so there's a lot going on in that uh, picture. Uh, and kids need that time for their mental health. The colors are relaxing. Everything about it is calming and centering. And uh, we need more of that. And schools and school gardens are part of that. Here's, we're going to talk about two reasons why people have a hard time getting a hold of this. The best people in branding and the history of branding and advertising were the Enlightenment. They called themselves the Enlightenment. Before us, it was all dark. There was not a brain to be found. <laughs> but now it's, oh, what a great break. Um, well, Aristotle, long before the Enlightenment, thought he had the same idea. But uh, that's uh, Kant and that's uh, Descartes, uh, who are the two big thinkers internationally, that is to say in Europe, of, uh, of the Enlightenment. And what the Enlightenment claimed to do was that we have discovered reason. And reason should be prevailing in society which is, like nutrition, a good idea as long as it's in context. And um, this is also the century in the age of reason that slavery became widespread, where nobody's reason led them to think women should have the right to vote. So their reason wasn't that reasonable by today's standards. But we got, in the same way of nutrition, got narrowed down to food, science, and everything got narrowed down to a very narrow understanding of reason. And the difference between us as humans and animals was we have reason and they're not, they don't. We have a soul, therefore, and they don't. That was Mr. Descartes, you owe that thought to. And this guy was so smart, he's most famous for a statement which is, I think, therefore I am. Huh. How about if you don't eat? And you think, are you still going to be an amine? No, you ain't, right? So <laughs> I garden, therefore I can. OK? And so as 
the domination of the Enlightenment, which is most powerful in educational institutions, is to celebrate and, and isolate reason from all other ways of knowing. All the ways that you identified through group learning and the like are denied because of the Enlightenment tradition deep, deep, deep in our unconscious that no one acknowledges that they have. But you know, the American Revolution was led by people who thought in terms of the Enlightenment, the Constitution, and all the great documents of the Federalist Papers are saturated with Enlightenment thinking. And you don't even know it. It's just part of the air you breathe. And you may not even have been taught in school that the American Revolution was a product of the Enlightenment, but it was the number one product of the Enlightenment. Um, and the second is nutritionism. This is a picture of promoting the registered dietitian with Coca-Cola on the top. <laughs> so, um, and again, it is this concept that food can only, it's deep, deep in the unconscious, that food can only benefit to basically a stronger mind, maybe a stronger body, you eat more B vitamins, you get calmer. But very narrow, and Canada has a new food guide and it says, Half of food has to be what you eat, and half of food has to be how you eat. Eat with others, eat with pleasure, and take your time. How many schools follow that practice? <laughs> huh? They don't know anything about nutrition. They think they know about nutrition, it's stuffing it down your face. So, this is my cat smarter than any of your cats, a product of the Enlightenment. And so the thing about my cat, I did ask her to pose for this, but um, is what she knows that most people in the educational bureaucracy don't know is you can only solve a Rubik's Cube on six sides. You cannot solve it one side at a time, okay? And the sick and food is exactly the same. Anything important is the same as the Rubik's Cube. The six sides are health, environment, economy, empowerment, culture, and community. Those are the six sides of food. Every one of those you connect to gardens at school. Every one of them. And it doesn't get rated as a factor because people don't understand we're dealing with a Rubik's Cube. And <clears throat> I think food policy has centered around two things. One is the supply chain, okay, which is sometimes called agribusiness. So we get rid of the culture in agriculture and replace it with agribusiness. And that is, how do you get food from where it starts to your plate? And maybe even if you have a long idea of the supply chain from the seed to the soil again. The second element of uh, food thinking is centered around nutrition. How do we get food as a fuel and as a, a set of nutrients? Rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, thanks for the grub, yay God. That's sort of the, the way I learned to say grace as a kid among other kids, right? Not a sense of let's be gr grateful for all the people who contributed to food and all the forces but just feed us, right, Get Jim? And so I've developed a third, what I think we need a third stream of food policy. I'm not knocking supply chain or nutrients. We need the needs of people to be together, to use your hands, to put your hands in dirt, to feel wholesomeness, to work with others, to get out of a classroom and just feel liberated. And these are kids in the highest crime area in Toronto. Okay, and just like the kids in the schools that we saw yesterday, and here they are, bad hombres. <laughs> and all of them learning how to farm and, and, and learn to work together and having a hoot, doing a very simple amount of work and just having a really good time. That is what people-centered food policy is about, and it's what outdoor classrooms and school gardens are about. Thank you very much.